Welcome to Sort of Like This. I'm Jordan, and today I'll be sharing a collection of Cinema 40 tips and tools that I use to speed up my workflow, problem solve, and get my ideas out faster. This is part two of the collection of Cinema 4D tips and tricks. The first video covered tips for customizing Cinema 4D and navigating. In the second part, I'll be sharing tips I find most useful for improving your workflow, reducing the amount of clicks to accomplish things, and useful tools that could also speed up your workflow. These tips help keep workflow interruptions to a minimum for me. They also help me reduce the amount of clicks it takes to do tasks, and it just lets me spend more time creating. Hopefully, no matter your experience level, you'll find something useful out of this. Anyway, let's get started. One area where I could reduce the amount of clicks I need is when I'm adding objects, fields, or modifiers to my scene. Before I knew this tip, I would add a modifier, then drag it below the object I wanted to modify. That's more clicking and dragging than it really needs to be. If I first select the object that needs the modifier, hold shift, then click taper or something, it automatically gets applied as a child to the cylinder. Now say I want to add it to a cloner. Instead of adding the cloner and then dragging the cylinder as a child of the cloner, I can just hold alt and click cloner. Now the cylinder is a child of the cloner. If you hold control, I'm guessing this works as command on a Mac, but I don't have a Mac to test, and add an object, it gets added below the selected object, but not as a child. Related to this is the shortcut to add selected objects into a null. Normally, you might add a null, then drag all the objects into it. That's way more clicking and dragging than it needs to be. Now you can select all the objects you want to add to a null, hit Alt and G, and they'll all be added as a child of the null. And if you want to undo that grouping, you can hit Shift and then G. If you want to make a copy of any object, you might normally go to the Object Manager, select the object you want to copy, hit Ctrl and C, and then Ctrl and V. But if you want to make a copy of an item even faster, there is a way. In the viewport, select the item you want to copy, hold Ctrl, and move the object. Now you have a copy of the original object. Just make sure that you release the mouse button before releasing the Ctrl key. This also works in the Object Manager. If you want to completely undo any rotation or position changes to an object, there's a handy little button for that. In older versions of Cinema 4D, this button was hidden, but in recent versions, this button was added to the main UI palette. It's the Reset Transform button, which used to be called the Reset PSR. This button is good for a lot of actions. If you have an object that you're working on and decide that you didn't like what you did with basic transforms, you can reset it back to its default position and rotation. If the object isn't a child of another object, it will reset back to the center of your scene. But the main reason I use it is to put new objects in the same spot as other objects to help me position objects faster. I'm going to put this second spoon next to the spoon that already exists. So I'm going to make it a child of the already existing spoon, then hit reset transform. Now I can quickly place the spoon in a nice position next to the original spoon. I have this group of tubes, they're in a parent-child chain, and if I need to select all the children at once to do something, say change their anchor points or add them to a layer, I might select the parent, hold shift, then select the bottom child. There's a faster way to do this though. Just middle mouse button the parent whose children you want to select. Now the parent and all the children are selected. I can move their anchor points all at once, or I could add them all to a layer. But what if I want to do something to the parent object by itself and not affect the children? To do this, hold the 7 key on your keyboard. Now I can move, scale, rotate the parent object by itself, and the children are unaffected. And if you let go of 7, it's now back to a parent-child relationship. Another area where I cut down on all the clicks and make my workflow more efficient with shortcuts is toggling visibility. In case you didn't know, you can toggle viewport and render visibility with those stacked dots next to the object in the object manager. I used to double click each dot to toggle the visibility, then again to turn it back on. But grouping items in nulls and toggling the visibility of the null helps speed that up. But there are other shortcuts that also speed up this process. If you hold alt, you can toggle both buttons at once. If you click and drag, you can toggle the visibility of objects directly above or below the object. If you hold shift, you change the order in which way they toggle. If you click it without holding shift, it goes green, red, then none. But if you hold shift, it goes red, then green, then none. So you can hold shift, 
Alt, and click and drag a whole stack to toggle them all off with just one click and drag. Then just hold Alt and click and drag to toggle them all back on. You can also Control or Control plus Alt click on a parent object to toggle the visibility of everything below it. I'm not sure how useful this one specifically is since toggling the parent alone also affects the children, but I thought I would mention it in case you have a use for it. One tip to speed up your Redshift workflow is if you're using the new nodes, is to add all your most used nodes as your favorites. Normally, you would have to find a node in all the folders or search for it. But if all your most used nodes are favorited, they're all in your favorite section and already organized. It should help you find all the nodes you need faster. I have this group of cubes that I want to rename. I could rename each one individually, but there's an easy and quick tool to help me rename objects, and that is the naming tool. If we go to Tools and click the Naming tool, we can see there's a few options and attributes we can use to help rename our cubes. If we select them all and type cube in the replace box, it searches for all the objects we have selected with the name cube. Then we'll type in box with the replace with box, then hit replace name, and we see that all the cubes are now named box. We can also add prefixes and suffixes here. For the prefix, I'll add grid so I know that these are part of the grid and I'll add dollar sign $n in the suffix. Now, if I hit replace name, we can see all the cubes are now named grid box and they are numbered. We can also do dollar sign $a to have them labeled alphabetically instead of numerically. If you have a dense scene or simulation and the viewport playback is a little sluggish, you can set it so it doesn't play back every frame in an attempt to play back in real time or close to real time. I have the simple particle simulation. When I play back the cache, it plays back really slow. If I wanted to go faster, I can go to Timeline, click and hold the icon with an A on it, and uncheck all frames. Now the sim plays back closer to the real time, but it's still a little choppy because it skips frames. This is great if you need to see an animation at or close to real time to check timings. If you need to move the access center of an object quickly and easily, you can use the access center tool. This tool can be found in tools, axis, axis center. One of the reasons I use it a lot is to lower the access to the bottom of an object. So when I hit reset transform, it sits on a surface that's at the center point of the scene. I'm gonna select my polygon cube, open the access center tool and drag the Y slider all the way down. Now, when I hit reset transform, the cube is sitting on the surface. This is the main reason I use this tool. Another use case for this tool I find a lot is to reset any weird axis mistakes or if I import an object that has the center axis in a weird position. This other cube I have set up has the axis way outside of the cube. Instead of toggling the move axis tool, I'll just open the axis center tool with the second cube selected. I'll make sure all the sliders are at 0% and then hit execute. Now the axis point is centered in the object. I also wanted to point out this doesn't work for parametric objects like this non-editable cube. It only works with polygon objects or non-parametric objects. Another useful tool or action I wanted to share was Edge to Spline. Edge to Spline does exactly what it sounds like. It takes an edge or a line from an object and creates a spline from it. You can use it for any number of things. In this example, I'm using it to put a label on a can. I loop selected an edge that goes around the middle of the can. Once I have the edge I want to use selected, I'll go to Mesh, Edge the Spline. A separate spline was created from the edge we have selected. And now I have a spline that's the exact size I need to use with a spline wrap modifier to make a label for this can. This tool is perfect if you need the spline to reference an edge from a model for something. This one's a quick tip. If you need to extrude an object, normally you would hit M then T or go to Mesh then Extrude or use the tools on the side of the viewport to get to the Extrude tool. Doing it this way, you get all the extrude options. But if you just want to do a basic extrude, you can select the edges or polys that you want to extrude, hold control, and then click and drag. This hotkey is great if you just need to extrude a little bit to touch up an object or do some basic model manipulation. This next tip is great for lighting or if you need to move an object around your scene but always have it face a specific way, like a background plane or something. The target tag is great for these situations. I often add a target tag to most of the main lights in my scene, and I'll set the target to the subject I'm trying to light. 
and when I move the lights around, it's always facing the subject. To do this, right click on a light in your object manager, go to animation, then grab the target tag. Click on the tag, and now find the subject you want to light, and then drag that into the target field of the light. As you can see, whenever I move the light, it's always facing my can. This is also great for background planes. With this plane, it's always trying to face the camera as I move it around. This should help you save some time when designing your scenes. In one of the more recent versions of Cinema 4D, we got Red Giant's Magic Bullet looks built in. If you use Redshift or some other renderer with its own IPR, you might have noticed that when you send it to Magic Bullet looks, you only get the viewport, which makes it hard to see what it's doing to your look. To get around this, you have to send a frame of your scene to your picture viewer, and then use the Magic Bullet looks button that says picture viewer. Now you can see what Magic Bullet looks is actually doing to the look of your scene. If you are using a render engine that doesn't play too well with the viewport, you can get into situations where it's hard to edit or see objects in your scene. You can disable materials in the viewport for situations just like this. If you go to the options menu of the viewport, you can toggle materials on and off. But to make this even faster, there's a shortcut for this. If you hit N then Q, you can toggle materials on and off. There's another option if you want the ability to toggle a material on a specific object is to use the display tag. Right click on the object in the object manager, go to render tags, and then click display tag. Now if you check the box for materials, you can toggle that material for that specific object on and off. In this scene, let's say I'm toying with clones to get an idea of where I might want to put trees for a forest or something. Doing it this way, you don't have any high poly count objects in your scene making the viewport sluggish. Let's say I like the way these clones are positioned now. I'm going to make the cloner editable now. I want to replace all these cylinders with trees. I have this tree from the asset browser in my object manager. I'm going to select all the cylinders in the object manager, then go to tools, and click the preferences icon next to the replace tool. With this I have a bunch of options. The only thing I'm going to change though is I'm going to select tags as well, this way materials are also replaced. Then hit OK. And now select the object you want to be placed. For me it's the tree. Now all the cylinders are replaced with trees and my forest is on its way. Sometimes when you're modeling, you want to move polygons or points and you want the outer connected ones to move with it but gradually fall off as it gets farther away. Kind of like sculpting, just to smoothly deform or change the shape of your model. This is done with soft selections. I have this car from the asset browser and I want to add some dents to the hood. If I select any polys without soft selection and I move them around, they have a rough look to them. But if I enable soft selection by going to the target icon at the top and then going to soft selection options, I have different settings I can use to control what I select and how the connected polys are affected. Now if I select some polys and make some dents and damage, it looks much more natural. I use the polygon pen tool a lot to start modeling from scratch. I'll outline a reference image with polygons to get started. Then from there I would normally get back to the basic modeling tools, but I was playing around recently with the polygon pen tool and found out some useful and time saving tips to keep using it even after I'm pretty deep in the modeling an object. The first tip is to use the polygon pen tool just to add some points. I don't need to switch to point mode or get the knife tool out. This saves me time and a bunch of clicks. Let's select the polygon pen tool from the side. Now if I hold shift on an edge it creates a point. I'm still in polygon mode and I haven't switched tools. That's a bunch of time saved, especially if you have a complex model that you would normally need to go back and forth with using a bunch of different tools. Another thing the polygon pen tool can do that I found out about not long ago is that it can make arcs from existing edges. If you hover over an edge, hold control and shift, then you move the cursor up without clicking, you can see an arch being formed. Now if you click and hold, then drag your mouse left or right, you can add or subtract subdivisions. Then just release your click and now you have an arch. If you need to give something some thickness but would also like to keep it parametric, you can do this with the cloth surface object. I have a plane that I want to add thickness to, but I still want to keep the ability to change its segments. To add thickness normally, I would have to make it editable and extrude, but with the cloth surface object, I can do that and still be able to make adjustments to the plane. With every version, the cloth surface object seems to change locations, so to make it easy, we're going to use Shift C to find it. Select the plane from the object manager, hit Shift and C, and type in cloth. 
We want the cloth surface. Hold Alt to make the plane a child of the cloth surface and double click the cloth surface. Now, if we select the cloth surface in the object manager, we can see some options and thickness is one of them. Just change the thickness to whatever you need and now you have a thick plane that you can still make adjustments to. In this scene, I have an ice cream scoop in a bowl and I want to add a little bit of chocolate swirl on it. The quickest way to do this that I know of at least is to use the projection tool to project the spline onto it. To start, I'm going to grab the spline pen tool and click once just to get the height right. Then middle mouse click and move to the top view. And now I'm going to make a rough swirl shape over the ice cream. If this was a real project, I would take my time to make the curves a little bit nicer, but this is just an example. After I get a shape I like, I'll hit escape to get out of the tool. Now I'm going to subdivide it a little bit, just so there's some more points to move around when it's projected. Now I'm going to hit shift C and search for project. Now I'm going to double click on the projection tool. In the attributes window, you can see some options. I'm going to keep it in view mode, which uses my view as the point of origin. I'm still in top view and I'm going to hit apply. And now when we go back to perspective view, we can see the spline has been draped over the ice cream. With that, I can just sweep that spline to get that syrup on my ice cream. Adjustments will be needed, but this is a great way to get most of the way there. I know a lot of people don't enjoy modeling, but I wanted to share a way of modeling that's easier than hard surface modeling and is parametric. Using the Volume Builder, Volume Mesher, and Z Remesher, you can pretty quickly model some complex shapes, and it's a ton of fun to use. This isn't a full-on tutorial for these tools, just an introduction to hopefully get you curious about it and help you model. For this example, I've been experimenting with it to make an octopus tentacle for a scene I want to do in the future. To start, I have this spline in the shape of a curled tentacle. Then I have a cloner pushing a modified circle down the spline. I have a step effector shrinking the circles as it gets close to the end. Then these clone circles are being lofted to make the shape. Now I have the tentacle shape, but I need the suction cups. I have a modified cylinder and a cloner with the same step effector to make those suction cups. Now the real magic happens. I have my tentacle arm and the suction cup cloner inside of a volume builder. When I turn it on, we can see the suction cups now look like they are part of the tentacle. And now if I turn on the volume mesher, we get a polygon mesh out of it. But as you can see, it's way too dense for anything useful. Now I put the volume builder inside of a remesher, set to Z remesher with a mesh density of 8%. Now we have a mesh that's a lot more manageable with some good looking topology. The volume builder and volume mesher are inside the volume tool set next to the object manager. And the remesher is inside the subdivision tool set. Using these tools, I was able to make this complex shape pretty quickly. Thanks for watching. I hope you were able to find something useful out of this. For me, these tips help me save a lot of time and create new things, especially with that volume builder and Z remesher combination. I love those tools. If you have any tips or tools you use to create things or make things easier or faster, let me know. I would love to hear them, so please comment down below. If you're looking for any more tips, check out the first video in this series. I have a few more videos planned, so I hope you'll stick around. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time on Sorta Like This.